Welcome uh, to the Center for Subsurface Energy and the Environment uh, webinar series. My name is Matt Balhoff. I'm the director of the center. To learn more about us and how to collaborate, visit our website as shown here. Follow us on LinkedIn, and uh, we also have a, a YouTube channel that you could join. A little bit more about us is that uh, we are a research center at the University of Texas at Austin. We have approximately 25 principal investigators, as you see here, in addition to over 100 graduate students and postdoctoral research researchers. We do uh, research um, in a lot of different areas of subsurface energy in the environment. You can see some of our subsurface applications, the technical disciplines we use, and our engineering tools. We collaborate with industry a lot of different ways. One of those is the industrial affiliate programs, and I've listed uh, them here. Um, you'll notice that I've bolded the Net Zero Initiative, uh, which is uh, a new industrial affiliate program that uh, we're in the process of, of creating, hopefully launching this fall. And uh, that will be closely related to the topic of today's webinar. So uh, about our webinars, uh, these are informative industry driven webinars by researchers and collaborators in the center. They're hosted the second Tuesday of the month at noon via Teams. And uh, while we do enjoy live participation, all webinars are uploaded to our YouTube channel within a few days. You can visit our YouTube channel to see dozens of uh, past webinars. Uh, next month is tentatively by John Foster and Michael Perch on what it takes to be a data science engineer. And um, today's webinar is the Net Zero Initiative. It's a panel discussion for decarbonization pathways in the oil and gas sector. Uh, I would ask that if you have any questions that you post them in the uh, in the Q&A section and we'll try to get to those uh, but a little bit more about our speakers today so uh, Dr. Hugh Daigle is an associate professor in the Hildebrand Department of Petroleum Geosystems Systems Engineering and the Center for Subsurface Energy and the Environment he holds a BA degree in the Earth and Planetary Sciences from Harvard University and a PhD in Earth Science from Rice uh, his industry experience includes being a wireline a field engineer at Schlumberger, as well as a petrophysicist um, at Schlumberger, Brigham Oil, and Chevron. Uh, his e research interests are in the area of uh, flow through porous media, geohazards, gas hydrates, and sustainable energy for the tra energy transition. Dr. Av Arvind Ravi Kumar is a research asso associate professor in the Department of Petroleum Geosystems Engineering and the Center and holds a non-resident fellow at the Payne Institute for Public Policy at the Colorado School of Mines. Over the past decade, he has led several projects focused on methane measurements across the oil and gas supply chain, new technology assessments, and development of techno-economic models to evaluate methane emissions policy. His current research focuses on developing and deploying multi-scale measurement protocols for quasi-real-time estimation of methane emissions across oil and gas supply chains. So with that, um, I will turn it over to uh, Hugh Daigle and, um, and Arvind, who will um, present a few slides and we'll open it up for some questions. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming to our webinar. Uh, the way this is going to work is we're going to present uh, a little bit on the background of the Net Zero Initiative, and then we'll begin our panel discussion. Um, as Matt said, my name is Hugh Daigle. I'm an associate professor affiliated with the center, and I have here um, Arvind Ravi Kumar, uh, who is a research uh, research professor um, affiliated with the department. And I'm going to hand it over now to Arvind uh, to begin the discussion. All right. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Hugh. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, we are very excited to talk to you about our um, Net Zero initiative here in, in the Petroleum Engineering Department at UT Austin. Um, what I'm going to be doing over the next 30 minutes is give you an introduction of, of why we are doing this now and what are some of the activities and research that we are planning as part of this Net Zero initiative and, and how you as industry members could get involved in some of the plans that we have going forward. The first thing is, you know, if you look at the, the websites of major oil and gas companies right now, what we notice is that 
we are on the cusp of a transformation within the world of fossil fuels, specifically oil and gas. Um, you know, BP has their net zero campaign. Uh, European oil giant Repsol has as net zero targets, but interim targets as well. And you look at companies investing in new technologies such as hydrogen, geothermal, and other technologies of this energy transition. And the question is, why is it different this time as compared to some of the other times we talked about the transition? And there are several major reasons for this. First one is there's a lot more public and global awareness of the need to, to reduce global carbon emissions. Uh, and simultaneously, several emissions reductions opportunity, specifically around methane emissions, for example, are, co are cost competitive or will be very soon. And this presents a huge opportunity for growth in new technologies such as hydrogen ecosystem that could form the backbone of this energy transition. And what we are already seeing in the oil and gas world is that there is a demand for industry differentiation that could soon become a reality with the advances in technologies that we are seeing. Uh, and the best part of this is that it's not just one company or one sector that is doing this, this push towards net zero emissions. What we are seeing is that players in every major sector are announcing bold plans for significant emissions reductions. This includes, of course, oil and gas companies, but also technology companies, uh, financial institutions, airlines, and, and other companies across a wide range of sectors announcing their plans to reduce emissions over uh, the next few decades. And this is something that's reflected in global policy as well. In fact, what we are seeing is that you know, global emissions are increasingly coming under net zero pledges. So if you just look at you know, what happened within the global policy arena between January 2020 and April 2021, despite an ongoing and enraging pandemic, what we saw was that the countries that had net zero targets in one form or the other increased from about 34% of global emissions to 57% of global emissions with at least some sort of net zero discussion. And on the right, you can see the different countries that have carbon neutrality targets as of April of last year. And in fact, if you include some of the newer countries that have announced since April 2021, you will see that the the total global emissions that are under some form of a net zero discussion has increased to about 67%. So over two thirds of global emissions are already committed to achieve net zero emissions by uh, mid-century or around their off. And, and this is something uh, that, is, that is being increasingly discussed within the context of the Paris Agreement as well. And so what we are seeing is that, you know, natural gas and oil has a significant role to play even in a net zero emissions world. So the, the figure in this graph is taken from the latest IPCC report um, and you're seeing it uh, watermarked because this report has not been finalized. But I wanted to bring this here because it tells us the, the gap between you know, what we think uh, we should get to in terms of Paris Agreement goals of 1.5 or 2C versus where we are currently. And what this tells us is that even in a world that achieves the Paris Agreement targets of 1.5 degrees Celsius of uh, global temperature increase, gas primary energy consumption in 2050 is about 60% of what we see currently. That is a significant amount of natural gas uh, ecosystem still present in a net zero emissions world. And so the key question is to achieve these targets, what kind of transformations, what kind of systems, what kind of technologies do we need uh, to be able to go from a world where we are currently with, with dominated by fossil fuels to a world that achieves net zero emissions by mid-century. And so this is this is sort of one example of, of an ecosystem that requires us to, to work in areas of, of production, transmission, distribution, and demand uh, as, as one large energy system. And so shaping this landscape requires a systems approach to research, planning, and deployment. So it's not enough to just to develop uh, cost-effective ways of hydrogen production, for example. You would also have to think about methods for, for transmitting that hydrogen to demand centers, thinking about where are the demand areas that would be most suited for, for hydrogen deployment at scale. And so all of this has to happen within the next 30 years. And this is critical because infrastructure lifetimes are long. Anything we build today, anything we build tomorrow will be around in 2050. And so the question of net zero emissions by 2050 is not a question for tomorrow or 10 years from now. It's a question for today. 
what kind of infrastructure do we need to put in place today so that we achieve our goals of net zero emissions by 2050? And so part of what we want to do in this initiative is think about and work with, with stakeholders on what that planning process looks like. What kind of research questions do we need to answer right now? And how do we translate uh, research insights and pilot demonstrations into deployment at scale and, and associated policy initiatives that can move us in the right direction? So, you know, getting to net zero, as we have just seen, and as, as told by the IPCC as well, does not mean that the world will stop using fossil fuels, uh, especially natural gas and oil, because we just saw that, you know, 2050 natural gas consumption, even in a 1.5C world, is 60% of what we are consuming now. And so reducing global carbon emissions while providing the energy that's needed by the world presents a tremendous opportunity. And I think as a leader in oil and gas research, our department is, is uniquely positioned to be academic leaders along with all collaboration with all of you in this energy transformation. And so that brings us to this net zero initiative. And so what we want to do with this net zero initiative is that we want to develop cutting edge systems level technological and policy solutions for cost effective and equitable approaches to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 with a focus on the future of the oil and gas sector. And, and the key question and the key phrase here is that systems level technological and policy solutions. And, and the reason is why do we need a systems approach, right? So what you're seeing here is uh, a recent paper in science that was published looking at what does a net zero energy system look like? And what you're seeing here is that a combination of hydrocarbons, hydrogen, CO2 pipelines, and a variety of energy sources that go from geothermal, hydrogen, oil and gas, nuclear, as well as renewable energy. So the question for us is, you know, how does all of these systems work together? Where are the energy sources that are going to be most suitable for residential and commercial applications versus energy sources that are going to be most suitable for industrial applications? How do we get from, from the energy source to the energy demand centers. And what kind of infrastructure do we need to develop, whether it is new pipeline systems, whether it is new storage technology, or whether it's new demand side approaches and, and policies to be able to get to that net zero emissions by 2050. And so what we're going to do over the next five or 10 minutes is to give you examples of how uh, our department can integrate the science, the systems, and the deployment aspects of, of an energy transition uh, as, as one coherent systems approach to achieving our net zero emissions target. So I'm going to be giving an example focused on what I've been working on for the past few years, looking at addressing methane emissions from, from oil and gas operations. And what I'll show is that uh, we do fundamental research to understand new technologies and understand what are the ways to reduce emissions cost effectively. Uh, I'll show you some of the models that we develop uh, to understand how methane mitigation fits within the broader scope of activities in, around reducing emissions from oil and gas operations. And finally, I'll show you how we work with companies to, to deploy these technologies at scale so that we can achieve the emissions reductions uh, of the sort that's possible only with the collaboration of, of industry, academia, and, and support of public policies. So these are all images from recent field campaigns that have been part of over the past three to four years, where we have been testing a lot of new methane leak detection technologies. Uh, as many of you might know, uh, there are now satellites, planes, drones, and other technologies such as continuous monitoring systems that promise cost-effective methane emissions detection. And so we have been taking them out at controlled facilities in Colorado, California, uh, up north in Canada, uh, and testing them out in controlled conditions and in field conditions. Can the technology work in the harsh winters of North Dakota or the really hot summers in the Permian Basin? What are the limitations under which these technologies are, are, are working? And how, what kind of data are these technologies providing operators? And is that useful to, to take follow-up action on reducing emissions? We, we understand the fundamental science on how these technologies work so that we can inform policies and regulatory approaches to address methane emissions from oil and gas operations. And so what we do is we take all of the data that we gather from the field from testing these systems and develop models 
that helps us think about the cost effectiveness of methane emissions mitigation framework. Um, as some of you might know the feast model is one such techno economic model that talks about you know what are the cost effectiveness of using many of these different technologies to address methane emissions. So we work with the EPA and other state regulatory agencies to think about how can they allow for the deployment of these new technologies that are being developed. We also work with operators to, to design deployment protocols. You know, if you're using a plane system for methane emissions, how often do you do these surveys? What are the cost implications of deploying a certain technology? And what is the most suited technology for, say, a compressor station or a refinery as opposed to a production well site? And what we do is once we think about these things and we make the choices in, in collaboration with some of these operators, we start thinking about deployment at scale. And so we work with industry, we work with solution providers, and we even work with lawyers to think about how can we translate the science of, of these technologies, the effectiveness of these approaches to methane detection into policies and, and systems that are effective in addressing this methane emissions challenge. And we, of course, assist companies with technology deploy deployment and scientific support regularly to make sure that what we learn from, from our research can be deployed at scale for the purposes of emissions reduction. And in the, here's one example that we're trying to do with some companies is deploy company-wide comprehensive emissions monitoring and deployment plans. So you have a production well site. Uh, we deploy level one technologies, which many companies already do. Uh, that could include on-site camera-based surveys of emissions. Uh, then we, we layer different technologies on top of it. For example, we do drone-based measurement that can tell you any issues that you have with certain equipment on your facilities. Uh, we do aerial measurements that can cover very large areas fairly quickly. So within a day, you can cover about 100 facilities and that can tell you which of your sites are uh, or something that you need to address in terms of emissions. Because too often the problem is not that there's methane emissions on every site. The problem is that out of 100 sites, maybe three or four sites might have your methane emission problem. So we work with companies to deploy some of these uh, technologies and, and design a, a protocol for surveys so that you can achieve cost-effective emissions reductions. And finally, uh, we also actually work with uh, with satellites to think about long term monitoring of your asset portfolios. In fact, uh, if if you if you Google some of these projects, we have a recently announced uh, Chenier, UT Austin, and Midstream operators uh, QMRV program, which is the quantification, monitoring, uh, reporting, and verification program to to really estimate and and develop real time measures of methane emissions from from the midstream oil and gas segments, the compressor stations and pipelines. And so what you see here is an example of where fundamental research on, on technologies, how these technologies work, what are their limitations, can translate to systems and models for effective policy design, as well as deployment in collaboration with these operators on thinking about how do we scale these technologies to achieve the sort of emissions reductions we require in the sector. And so what you're going to see next is another example in a completely different research space on how we integrate the fundamental science, the systems design, and the deployment at scale to, to make sure that we develop the right solutions as we move towards this energy transition and a net zero world. Okay, thank you, Arvind, for that component of the presentation. So I'm going to take over now and continuing on the theme of trying to present what we view as the systems level approach to planning for the energy transition. I'm going to give an example here uh, based on hydrogen. So what I'm showing here is uh, an extremely complicated diagram. This comes from a, a nice uh, publication from um, the IEA put out a couple of years ago. This is what they view is the entire hydrogen energy value chain. So it's everything from where, how you produce the hydrogen to how you store it and transport it to what the end users are, um, along with the various flows between these different um, components of the value chain. As you can see, it's, it's very complex. There's a lot of different components that have to work together. And what I'm going to focus on for this example just has to do with the storage, transmission, and distribution part of this energy value chain. And I want to show an example of how we can use the systems approach to optimize this component of the hydrogen energy value chain. 
So let's think about some system design questions that you would need to ask if you're seeking to be storing, transporting, and you know, distributing hydrogen. So let's imagine you've got some kind of a, a, a system here where you've got some combination of subsurface storage, either in a salt cavern uh, or a saline aquifer, something like that. You've got surface tanks for shorter term storage. You've got supply coming in either in a pipeline or by truck. And then you've got a distribution system where you either have a pipeline taking it to market, a uh, truck taking it to market, or you could even think of boats um, and that sort of thing carrying ammonia. So what are the questions that you need to ask to be able to get this system to work nicely as a, as a single component? So first of all, for the supply coming in, you know, if you're looking at using existing pipeline infrastructure for this, you can't really just transport pure hydrogen because of the highly corrosive nature of it. So it's uh, a good idea to try to blend that with some natural gas. What's the optimal natural gas to hydrogen blending ratio that you'll need to get the energy density transport that you require to meet your end needs? If you're injecting this into the subsurface for seasonal storage or storage on the time scale of years, what are your injection and withdrawal rates that you can safely uh, accomplish without causing mechanical damage to the, to the subsurface? Along those lines, if you're continuously injecting and withdrawing and injecting and withdrawing, this is a very different process um, from what we do, say, with carbon sequestration. Um, there's you know, cyclic loading that happens. And what is the effect of this, uh, these repeated cycles on the reservoir integrity and the cap rock integrity for that matter? Um, what steps can you take to reduce chemical or biological degradation of hydrogen during storage? What if the bugs eat it all and turn it into methane? That's no good. What are you going to do then? Um, so there's questions about the subsurface. Um, for your short-term storage on the surface, what's the optimal combination of short-term and long-term storage facilities? How big do they need to be? How frequently do you have to transfer hydrogen between the different storage components? And once you are sending the hydrogen to the end users, what's the most cost, cost effective combination of storage and transportation forms? For example, you know, blended gas, liquefaction, ammonia, solid carriers, that sort of thing. How are you actually going to move this stuff around? So there's a lot of questions you have to ask in order to be able to have an efficient, cost effective way of storing and transporting and distributing the hydrogen. So once you've you know, thought about these questions, you need to come up with a way of answering them. And so what we envision here is following along the model that you know, Arvind has so successfully developed with his FEAST model, uh, we envision developing a series of optimization tools that you can use for planning to optimize any and all components of your your system. So if you're looking at hydrogen, if you're looking at a microgrid, you know, those sorts of complicated things, you have pricing structures built into that. You can add various technologies and we seek to um, use our expertise here at the university and through collaboration with with industry and other stakeholders to come up with these series of tools that are going to be useful for developing the systems optimization that we really need to move the energy transition forward and achieve these net zero goals. So that's a little bit on what we view as the research questions. Now, another important component of the Net Zero Initiative is going to be an uh, education and outreach. And we have um, a number of facilities here already at the university that we can leverage um, to help with this. So um, there's the possibility of a future executive education program on sustainability with dedicated short courses um, on various topics, including hydrogen, geothermal, methane emissions mitigation. There's a lot we could do there and we would like to do in the future. Um, Many of you know that we recently launched uh, an undergraduate minor in sustainable energy. I'll be uh, teaching a course as part of that this fall. And um, there may be some possible new graduate programs uh, in the future as well. And so part of the Net Zero Initiative uh, will be to assist in developing new course offerings focused on sustainability for uh, these programs. An example would be carbon monitoring systems um, that you know maybe not be covered right now in the curriculum. Um, 
we can uh, develop certificate programs in in coordination with uh, the business school. And we, we hope to look into this in the, in the future uh, to increase the credentials that students can achieve uh, for sustainability. And most importantly, probably for our audience today is periodic training on the planning tools that we de will develop as part of this forthcoming IAP um, to make sure that everybody is continually up to date on the best practices and the best ways to use the tools that we're developing. Um, to do all this requires a collaborative, interdisciplinary, and hopefully impactful approach. And to accomplish this, we have a number of planned activities as part of the Net Zero Initiative, um, including this uh, concept of secondment where we can have either researchers from member companies can spend uh, an extended period of time here at UT to work with us on projects of, of interest or to have UT researchers um, be in residence at member companies for extended periods of time to work on projects. This will really help um, the mutual benefit uh, component of, the, of this initiative. Um, we're going to launch a energy policy and energy finance uh, fellowship for um, fellows to collaborate and translate the science and what we do here in the IAP to policy relevant insights um, to help uh, drive the policy component of what's going to be needed um, for you know, regulatory agencies and other, other institutions like that uh, to help move the energy transition along. And um, we also have a visiting scholars program, which will, um, similar to the secondment program, we'll have experts in technology policy, business, that sort of thing, um, work uh, for extended periods of time with the researchers as part of the IAP. And this will really help um, get the word out there and, and increase the impact of what we do here and the mutual benefit to the university and the member companies. So, the next steps here, um, as Matt said at the beginning, we hope to have this approved later this summer and launch the uh, Net Zero Initiative this fall. So please look for more information um, uh, over email in the next few weeks about some specifics about how you can uh, participate. Um, we will develop a newsletter that will be uh, offered through our uh, IAP website and more information on that will be forthcoming. Hopefully we'll have this inaugural event in the fall when we're able to launch the IAP. But in the meantime, if you are interested in becoming a member or want to talk about other ways to collaborate, please reach out to me. My email address is there. You can also find me on the, the uh, CSEE website. And um, for specific projects or you know, near-term modeling needs using Feast or, or other tools, please reach out to Arvind. Again, there's his email address and you can find that as well on the CSEE website. So that concludes the slideshow component of this presentation. And now um, we'd like to move to the uh, panel discussion. And as we said at the beginning, anybody in the audience who has a question, please post it in the Q&A um, and we'll uh, get to those as we can. OK, so um, I have some questions for Hugh and. Um, and Arvind, so uh, let me start here. So uh, I'll start with Arvind. Uh, what are the specific challenges with achieving net zero in the oil and gas industry? that can be addressed now, the next five years and the next 10 years? Right, so when we think of emissions reductions in the oil and gas sector, um, you know, several companies that I work with regularly have different approaches to addressing emissions. Um, there are near-term solutions for which we have the solutions. The solutions are cost-effective and companies are, are deploying that, those solutions at a large scale. I'll, I'll give one example. You know, methane emissions has emerged as sort of the, the low-hanging fruit in emissions reductions towards a net zero wealth pack. Uh, there are companies that have you know, long term plans on how they can achieve net zero emissions at the well pad, and this include from from the from right now addressing methane emissions. So we have the technologies, we have the solutions and these solutions are being deployed and we have been seeing methane emissions reductions from existing operations. In the medium term, the same companies are thinking about what kind of operational changes do they want on their well pad in their journey towards net zero and these things could include uh, uh, 
switching in, uh, pneumatic systems that run on natural gas to pneumatic systems that run on instrument air, uh, capturing gas that come off from equipment like tanks and, and burning them in a flare. So those are sort of medium term solutions that companies are thinking about, largely because some of them are not yet cost competitive, but that could soon become cost competitive uh, in the next five to 10 years. So the, the way I think about the sort of the near term and the long term challenges is that for the near term, we know what the solutions look like. Uh, we know what what their performance are. The key is to developing scale and deploying them across the country to achieve those emissions reductions. Longer term, it's more challenging because there are a number of decarbonization pathway, pathways that a company could choose from and exactly what pathway a company could choose depends on on the wide variety of variables, including public policy, as well as the future trajectories of these companies. So that's where an IAP like this could develop some of those uh, solutions to explore some of those pathways and figure out what would be the most ideal pathway for different uh, operators and companies. Yeah, I'll just chime in here also. Um, you know, if you look at the near term, the world needs energy and uh, you know, and, that, and that's a good thing. We need to be able to provide the, you know, the world with its energy needs. Um, in the near term, uh, you know, we, uh, you know, we're we're struggling with that, you know, a little bit. You can see some of what's going on in in Europe and other places with with natural gas prices. Um, and so it's, you know, the challenge right now is to be able to, you know. Um, come up with ways of, of providing that energy in a sustainable fashion. But in the long term, actually, this presents a real opportunity because we can completely reimagine the way that we integrate all these different energy systems together um, and, you know, come up with ways of, of doing this in a sustainable fashion. And I think that's really the long term challenge is, uh, you know, thinking about energy and distribution systems and production systems and combining everything together like that figure th that we showed. OK, that, that's great. I have a follow up question. Maybe we'll start with you, Hugh, and, and Arvin may have uh, some additional uh, thoughts on this, but what are some of the key opportunities for emissions reductions in the near term? That's a yeah, that, that's a good question. So I think Arvin you know, mentioned this earlier. So methane, everybody talks about this as as the low hanging fruit. And there's been a lot of advances made in the last couple of years in terms of you know, reducing methane emissions, particularly in the Permian Basin. I think the industry obviously recognizes that this is a problem. Um, and so that's really the, you know, the, the main near term way of reducing emissions uh, associated with oil and gas uh, production that I see. Um, there's also, um, you know, some additional possibilities where you look at, you know, industries that are very carbon intensive and steps that you can take to reduce the emissions associated with that. So, for example, uh, cement production, um, you know, as the world builds more and more stuff, we're using a lot of concrete and cement production is extremely carbon intensive. And so, you know, finding ways to decarbonize the cement industry, the steel industry in terms of the fuels that they're using, um, there's really some opportunities there, I think, that we could look at in the very near term. Arvind, do you want to? comment on that. Sure. And one of the exciting parts of, of emissions reductions in the oil and gas space, and I think somebody commented on that in the Q&A as well, um, is that it, it's not just from an environmental sustainability perspective. Uh, there are a lot of market mechanisms that are coming into play that are sort of making companies uh, work on some of these oil and gas, uh, greenhouse gas emissions challenges. For example, as some of you might have heard, uh, there's been a push towards uh, certification or responsible natural gas, where oil and gas companies get certified that their greenhouse gas emissions along their uh, on all of their assets are below a certain threshold. These certifications are performed by third party companies, not because there's a requirement, a policy that requires this, but because large buyers, whether it's LNG exporters or utilities, are looking for buying to buy oil and natural gas that have lower emissions intensities. So what's happening in the near term is that um, at the same time when there are you know, progress towards emissions reductions, there are also these new market mechanisms that are coming into play that are further pushing us towards addressing emissions in a cost effective manner. So before we go on to the next question, Matt, we got a good question here in the Q&A that I think ties into this, which is have we considered, you know, combining EOR with carbon sequestration um, to reduce greenhouse emissions? And that's a really great example of, you know, easy near term steps 
uh, that we can take to you know achieve uh, you know net net zero carbon emissions. Um, you know I could envision this being part of a a systems optimization because you know obviously just pumping the CO2 in the ground and getting the oil out. That's just one you know, small component of the overall system that you're being a part of there. And so I think that's a really great example of, of things that we can do to you know, meet the continued need for fossil fuels while reducing the, uh, the overall carbon footprint. How are companies engaging in these near-term opportunities to reduce emissions? Yeah, so th th that's a great question because this is where I think there's a lot of opportunity for, uh, for for some for like I said, UT Austin to work with companies, and you know, this ties into another question in the Q and A that I want to bring in. Is that the question is that do any of the solutions offered towards net zero not involve heavy government involvement or command and control policies as opposed to a free market setting? And I think this is where there's been a lot of progress, at least on the oil and gas side in recent years. For example, now EPA is drafting methane mitigation policy as we speak. And, and, and the most interesting part of that is that the policies that they're drafting are actually informed by industry experience. You know, many industry operators have actually deployed some of the new technologies for methane mitigation over the past two to three years, and we are learning quite a bit from what those technologies can do, what are their limitations, and what are the best ways to incorporate them to address methane emissions. And so the way it's working is lessons from the industry, along with academic research on these subjects, are now actually informing EPA's methane policy. So hopefully when they actually come out, those reflect some of the learnings that we have already had from, from industry experience with these technologies. Um, the second thing, of course, is, is what I just mentioned earlier, where there's a lot of market-based mechanisms that, that push companies towards reducing emissions. So for example, utilities, um, LNG exporters are big buyers of, of US natural gas, and, and there's a demand from their end for reducing the emissions footprint of the oil and gas supply chain. So this can take the form of a, a premium price for natural gas if you can demonstrate low emissions, or it can take the form of um, you know, third party certifications that tell you that your oil and gas have lower emissions intensity than some other companies. So that kind of industry differentiation through market mechanisms and market approaches is growing significantly both in the United States and abroad. And I think that's where we're going to see a lot of movement, rapid movement, in fact, towards addressing uh, some of these uh, emissions reductions efforts across the supply chain. Hugh, uh, are there examples of projects in the sustainability area that serve as good examples of how universities can effectively collaborate with industry? Yeah, so there are you know a number of good examples um, right now. Uh, so a I'll, I'll touch on a couple, and you know again some of these relate to hydrogen because that's what I've spent a lot of my time thinking about. Um, in Europe, there's been a number of uh, consortia recently developed to uh, mainly with with institutions in the United Kingdom to focus specifically on hydrogen distribution and storage. So you know this is an area where you know, academic institutions with a lot of expertise in, uh, you know, subsurface geology and subsurface engineering are looking at tackling a new problem that, you know, industry doesn't necessarily have a lot of expertise with. And so applying that and taking those problems and applying that knowledge to, to that problem, that's a really good, you know, a really good way of going about that. Now here at the University of Texas, um, we have a new project that's, uh, it's, funded by the Department of Energy, it's called H2 at Scale, and uh, it's you know, in partnership with, with industry, and that uh, involves you know, building a um, methane generation system um, out of the Pickle Research Campus here, and allowing um, you know, companies to test various technologies um, on that system. So you know, I think the common thread there is taking facilities and expertise uh, and collaborations that we have at the university and opening that up to give the industry access to something that they might not necessarily have themselves. And you can really leverage that at a large, you know, prestigious university like, a, like the University of Texas. So uh, that's great. I, I'm going to uh, kind of change topics here um, a little bit. Uh, you are, are both launching this new industrial affiliate program, uh, hopefully this fall. Uh, on the net zero initiative. So uh, Arvind, how do you expect to interact with companies that, that join this IAP? 
Sure. So there are several ways for companies to work with us as part of this IAP. One of the uh, biggest benefits of joining an IAP is sort of the aggregation and pooling of resources to tackle tough problems together. For example, um, over the past few years when we have been developing and, and working on methane emissions research, you know, testing any one technology extensively takes a lot of resources. And a single company might not want to invest a million dollars in one specific project. And so what, what was helpful there was that you know, when we have an IAP, multiple companies can come together and collectively decide, hey, this is something we are interested in, and we are each willing to put a fraction of the amount required to do that work, and then let's proceed on that research. And so one of the biggest benefits and, and the way I see interacting with, with the industry as part of this IAP is, is to work together to think through some of the uh, long-term challenges, what kind of technologies do we need to test? What kind of technologies we need to develop? What kind of tools and models that we need to develop that can then be used by the industry, that can be then be used by regulators, and that can then be used by the financial uh, players? Uh, you know, thinking about things like ca uh, carbon accounting systems are all extremely popular now, and developing models to do that in an accurate and scientific way is something companies can collaborate with us on uh, through this IAP. And that's sort of the key aspect of having an IAP, that it does not just fall on one company to, to address or solve a problem. It is shared by all companies so we can work faster towards some of our goals. Hugh. Yeah, and actually this ties into another question we have in the in the Q&A here, which um, asked on the on the topic of policy solutions, um, you know, is our plan to engage with governing bodies, voluntary carbon markets, industry groups and that sort of thing. And that's exactly how we, we envision doing this. So one of the things that we get by having this large collaborative program is that we can interface between industry and you know some of these uh, governing groups. Arvind gave a really good example earlier on using you know research on methane emissions to help inform EPA regulations. Um, you know I think that's exactly the sort of thing we're going for, and that's the goal of the Policy Fellows Program. It's to take the learnings that we develop here and take them to some of these government agencies and other organizations that can use these learnings then to develop you know, more sound regulations and strategies and that sort of thing. So Hugh, as a follow up, what areas do you see are major areas of collaboration? Yeah, so major areas of collaboration, this would be, you know, uh, so first of all, um, taking the concept of, you know, hydrogen, for instance, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to hydrogen, hydrogen again. I think there's definitely a lot of interest in the industry in hydrogen <coughs> generation and, and distribution. And I think that would be a great avenue for collaboration with us between the expertise here that we have at the university and the facilities that, that we can offer. I think that's a really, um, a really great uh, example of that. Another thing is the education and workforce component of the work we're going to do. So, you know, as a you know, public university, it's part of our mission to educate the workforce that Texas and, you know, the nation and the world is going to need moving forward. And we need to be looking at what those needs are and how we can design our curricula to meet those needs. And so again, by collaborating with industry and listening to those needs and then using the tools we have here at our disposal, that's a really great way that we can really drive this forward and uh, help with the education and training that's going to be needed. There was a question in the Q&A about this specifically. In what ways would the proposed net zero initiative tie with the petroleum engineering programs at UT? And it's, you know, we're, we can you know, really leverage what we already have here in terms of educational possibilities within, you know, the you know, petroleum and geosystems engineering department and other engineering and other departments on campus. Um, I think it's, you know, really the, that's one of the reasons that we're so well situated to do this is because of, you know, being affiliated with the department and the other educational things that we have going on. Right, and one of the key aspects of this education and training program is, is not only to just train students in new areas of, of energy, for example, new classes on hydrogen or new classes on, on distributed energy systems, but the key is to make sure that we develop an ecosystem of users for the research that comes out of the Net Zero Initiative. So, you know, 
I talked about the feast model in the presentation, and we will be developing more such models that could be useful to the industry and regulatory agencies. But the goal is not just to develop the model and put it out there publicly. We, what we want to do is take that model and make sure there are people who are skilled at using it. So we'll develop training programs through UT Austin's executive education program to train people from companies to use those models internally. We will train regulators and, and agency staff to use those models. So not only are we creating the tools necessary for the transition, we are making sure that we are creating an ecosystem of users who will be using those tools and, and developing some of the, the solutions to address this challenge. OK, as, as a follow up to that a little bit, um, what benefit will member companies see from participation in the IIP? Yeah, so the the companies get will get a lot of benefits out of this. So one of the main ones is just having access to researchers and particularly students here. Um, you know, a lot of our students end up getting jobs through the industrial consortia that they were possibly affiliated with. And for those companies that are looking to increase their workforce, working on sustainability and, and net zero, uh, this is going to be a really great way to find those, um, you know, find that workforce. Um, and help uh, you know give input on on what that workforce um, is going to look like um, the second big uh, thing that the you know member companies can get out of this is access to all the planning tools uh, that we uh, hope to develop as part of it so you know feast is already an existing software um, package but we will be expanding its capabilities um, we'll be developing other tools I mentioned hydrogen earlier um, you know other tools for uh, looking at you know microgrids and distribution networks and and that sort of thing and so having access to those tools and the training uh, that will be you know associated with that to be able to use them effectively um, you know that's that's really um, another great benefit Another benefit is that by being part of the Net Zero Initiative, you know, if if you join, you will be able to influence and give input on the particular research directions that we go in. And so, you know, that's uh, I, I think that's a really great benefit because, uh, you know, we hope to be doing some good impactful work and, you know, we can't do that operating purely in a vacuum. We need that collaboration with industry and industry will get a lot out of that um, as well be, by being part of it. Arvind, do you want to chime in with, with some more? Right, um, sure. So one of the, so I'm going to t tell a story here uh, to illustrate um, you know, how, how how this IAP could, could help develop some of those solutions. I was, re recent, I was recently on a call with uh, with a federal agency uh, who, who basically asked me, you know, uh, how do we develop um, uh, low emissions blue hydrogen pathways in the United States? And I don't know, I didn't know if they realized it or not, but low emission blue hydrogen pathways is a very complex process. So you're going to look at expertise required in the natural gas supply chain and decarbonizing the natural gas supply chain. You're going to need expertise in hydrogen production processes. You're going to need expertise in carbon capture and storage, and you're going to need expertise in hydrogen transportation and storage. These are very distinct areas of research that people spend an entire lifetime on. And what we hope to do through this Net Zero initiative is to be able to do that kind of complex projects, to be able to that kind answer those kinds of questions that might look simple and intuitive on the surface, but require integration of expertise from several different areas of research. And, and the goal of this Net Zero initiative is to tackle some of those broader challenges so that when industry or, or an agency comes to us and says, hey, can you help us develop this, this net, uh, low carbon blue hydrogen pathways? That's something we can collaboratively work on and develop solutions for each of those challenges that I just described. Another question about the, the I guess the IEP and collaboration is, is that UT Austin and, and specifically the Hildebrand Department of Petroleum Geosystems Engineering and the Center for Subsurface Energy and the Environment has a lot of expertise and facilities. How do you think that those expertise and facilities can help industry in exploring sustainable pathways? 
Yeah, so you're right. We do already have a lot of existing um, existing facilities. So we have, you know, some very nice laboratory setups where we can do all kinds of testing. So let's say you want to optimize your hydrogen injection strategy. You know, we can we can look at that. You know, at temperature and pressure. Um, you, you know, we have you know a lot of expertise in, in the laboratory area. Um, we have a lot of expertise in numerical modeling. Um, again, within the department. Um, you know, we have several faculty members who are you know wide recognized as experts in data science and machine learning. Um, we have you know, several other consortia that um, you know, do some very sophisticated um, computational modeling. Um, and so there's, there's a lot we can leverage um, here already to tackle some of these um, complicated problems. Also, when you look more broadly at, at the university, I mentioned the H2 at scale. Um, uh, project. We've got, you know, some capabilities for for hydrogen production. Um, we have a lot of researchers looking at, you know, power and, and energy distribution networks. So we've got a lot of expertise both within the center and within the department and also in the university more broadly um, that can bring to bear on these problems. So I'm going to switch gears uh, again and, and talk a little bit about education and training that you talked about. So um, how do you feel the um, th this new initiative, this net zero initiative of uh, IEP will fit with the educational goals of the Hildebrand Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering? So th th that's a great question. So there are se several ways the, the goals of the net zero initiative directly interface with the educational goals of the department and, and the future of petroleum and geosystems engineering in general. Um, one of the key areas of interest, uh, not just among students, I mean, there have been numerous student surveys uh, saying that they are interested in energy transition, they are interested in sustainability questions. And so I, I think as, as the top department in petroleum engineering in the country, uh, it is on, it's our responsibility to provide those offerings to the students. And with the advances that we are seeing in technology, in, in new solutions to address these challenges, I think we are at the right moment where some of the learnings from, from what we are doing with this Net Zero initiative could be directly translated into the educational components of the department. This could include the new sustainability minor that we have here in the department that you can tell a lot more about. Uh, this could include developing new classes. And more importantly, uh, this could include developing collaborations with the business school. So students learning not just about the engineering of, of petroleum and geosystems, but as well as the economics and, and, the, and the finances of, of developing these solutions towards the energy transition. I think there's a lot of different possibilities and, and developing those uh, structures and certificate programs and minors will be a critical component of the goals of this initiative. Yeah, and if you look at the things that we already do well here, you know, we have very strong expertise in reservoir engineering and geomechanics and subsurface processes. And a lot of that expertise is going to be needed for the energy transition. If you think about subsurface energy storage, geothermal, um, you know, EOR, carbon sequestration, these are all things that utilize existing expertise that we already do well here. And so, you know, we have a lot to offer. Um, you know, the energy transition has a lot to offer for us as well. And so it's, um, you know, I think it's it's mutually beneficial for us and, and most importantly for the um, for the students. So uh, I have a few more questions, but since we only have a few minutes left, are there any other questions in the uh, from the audience that you'd like to address? Yeah, so we've got a couple of technical questions here. The first one, do you have any more information about the natural gas and hydrogen blending ratios that could be feasible for near term use? Yeah, so a lot of this depends on the material that your pipeline is made out of and what the uh, eventual end use uh, is going to be. So I talked earlier about what the energy density uh, is, is going to be you know needed for you actually to you know make it economically feasible to to do that do that blending and then the eventual separation at the end um, the the international energy agency um, uh, report from 2019 it's called the future of hydrogen um, it has some good information on that and um, you know, I encourage you to to you know use that as a starting point. But uh, yeah, it's a good example. It's one of those things that you know you have to optimize on a case by case basis. I've got another question here. Are we able to share this presentation um, afterwards? Um, I think the answer is yes. Um, I don't think there's anything in there that's that's proprietary. So if you're interested in having access to a copy, please email either myself or, or Arvind, and we'd be happy to share the slides. 
How do we address the inefficiency of energy storage systems in the future? This seems to be a critical item going forward. Yeah, that's that's absolutely correct. So any fuel source that you're using that is not oil or gas is going to be subject to the physical fact that oil and gas have an extremely high energy density that um, you know other energy sources don't have. And when you're trying to store and transport that, you know those those other energy sources, you lose even more. And so I think that there's there's two things that need to be done there. One, we just need more material science research. Um, you know, again, looking at uh, you know hydrogen carriers, you know, efficient ways of of doing that. And so you know, there's there's still a lot of fundamental work that needs to be done on that. But also, if you think about doing a systems level optimization, I think there's definitely ways that that, you know, you can look at the broader picture and try to, you know, come up with a way of, uh, you know, increasing the efficiency of your energy storage through a larger scale um, optimization. Another question there is, is flaring and effective mitigation to methane emissions, considering that CO2 is much less uh, of a pollutant than methane? I, I think that's that's right. Um, you know, if, uh, efficient flaring is an important uh way to, to reduce emissions in places where you do not have easy ways to capture uh, methane and route it into a pipeline. But there are also challenges. In fact, one of the most uh, active research areas is to how to keep flare efficiencies at over 98 or 99 percent. And that's something we are working closely with operators. Uh, there have been some challenges in some basins where flares uh, have been known to go out and not light back up. And that's something we want to address to make sure that we are not venting large quantities of methane, but are actually flaring them as CO2. Yeah, so uh, I think we're about out of time here. So that was um, an, an excellent presentation and um, a, a lot of good information in the in the Q&A. I, I did want to uh, follow up on, on Hugh's comment about sharing the presentation. We will, uh, we will post this entire webinar on our YouTube channel. Uh, that should show up in a few days, so we encourage you to go uh, visit our U YouTube channel at CSEE, and uh, you should be able to find the webinar, and please share the link with any of your uh, colleagues. Uh, if you have any additional questions, please contact uh, Hugh and Arvind, uh, whether it be technical questions or how to get involved in the new uh, potential industrial affiliate program. Um, and, uh, and of course, uh, again, we'd like to invite you to follow us on LinkedIn and to, to join our YouTube channel and to visit our website.